Oh see, yeah, I see. It's always from. <laughs> so you guys know I always have to have a joke. So Tammy or uh, Kathy sent this. It says a man was told his hair piece would cost twenty five dollars. It was a small price to pay. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay. All right. So, uh, like I said, Holy Spirit, I, I felt like He began to download this message to me, and uh, and and I wanted to highlight just a few biblical ideas about Holy Spirit today, as we celebrate Pentecost. And you know, a lot of um, prophetic words is that today is a marker. Uh, there's some uh, interesting things that will occur, some good things that will occur after uh, or beginning today. And, uh, and so I want to celebrate the day Holy Spirit was poured out into the earth. And you know, what's amazing to me is you have, um, when the Lord was caught up into the heavens, so he had been uh, uh, killed, he was resurrected. He uh, went, away, uh, went around for 40 <laughs> days. And then those that had died previously in faith also were resurrected and just basically cruised the streets of Jerusalem chit-chatting with people. And, uh, and Paul brings that out. And, uh, and so for 40 days, he showed himself resurrected to his people. When he was taken up in the clouds... Uh, and they're all, you know, staring. Five hundred of them are staring uh, at him as he ascends. Why is it on Pentecost there were only a hundred and twenty? Where were the other three hundred and eighty? And so, one thing that I want to impress upon you today is that Holy Spirit encountering Him and encountering the Lord is not a one-time event. It is a hunger and a pursuit for more, always. So it doesn't matter how much presence you feel now. It doesn't matter how much power you operate in now. It's are you going after more? If you study those that changed wells, the Azusa Street Revival, uh, the healing revivalists of the 40s and 50s, uh, Amy Simple McPherson, all of them, if you study their lives, they were never satisfied, yet they were content. And, and that's what I want to impart to you guys today is that there was a separate baptism and baptism of power. And even the Lord experienced that. In fact, let's just start there real quick over in Luke because that's what's coming to my heart. But pursuing the more of God is uh, crucial because you can get comfortable in the goodness of God. He, he's so good that just a little bit of His goodness can impact you in such a way that you don't continue to pursue the more. And so we see here uh, in Luke chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 1, this is right after Jesus was baptized with the Holy Spirit. He says, uh, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So at this point, he's filled. For the first time in the history of mankind, a man was filled to overflowing with Holy Spirit and Holy Spirit remained. There were temporary times, which we'll get into in a second, but this is the first time. And it says in verse 2, being tempted for 40 days by the devil, and in those days he ate nothing, and afterward when they had ended, he was hungry. Now that fascinates me, just as a little side note, because I hate fasting. And so my idea of fasting is to not be hungry until after. Mm -hmm. And he was. So that's, that's the goal I'm shooting for. But anyway, so the devil, he comes and he tempts him. Uh, but listen to this uh, in verse 14. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. So we have a filling at the beginning. We have a baptism of power after uh, the wilderness. So it's not two separate things, but in a way it is. And so a lot of times when you get filled with the Holy Spirit and you have to remain ever filled, there is a biblical mandate to go after the baptism of power. In fact, John G. Lake 
had a beautiful baptism of the Holy Spirit. He had already healed I don't know how many people. He was already activated in ministry in a powerful way, and yet he desired the more. He wanted to see 100% healings. He wanted to see the life Jesus led as a man in right relationship with the Holy, with Father, with the Holy Spirit. And then, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but if you look at Acts 10, 38, this is one of my life scriptures. Um, Acts 10, 38, it says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Why did he say Jesus of Nazareth? Because he was identifying his humanity. Because Jesus is not a model for us. He is a model of us. He is a model of how we're supposed to be now. And of course, through the progressing uh, work of salvation in your soul, as we come into agreement with the reality we already possess, we will walk in more of that revelation. But he anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Okay? So they're, they're uh, two separate events. And so I have positioned myself for the rem beginning of this last month for the rest of my life to pursue the with power. You know what I mean? I want <clears throat> that with power. I want where if anyone comes into this place with cancer, they walk out free. If anyone comes in a wheelchair, they walk out walking. If anyone dies, they're resurrected. Our goal should be nothing short of 100% of what Jesus Christ did plus more. Because according to John 14, he said that you'll do greater works than I did. You know what I mean? And so his uh, initial floor of power is our ceiling. Or his ceiling of power is our floor. And so uh, I just wanted to encourage you guys in this because it's a worthy call. And the more you pursue him, the more you walk in love. And faith is energized by love. He is love. Uh, the Holy Spirit has poured love into our hearts. So it's not that you're going after the power for selfish purposes. It's you're pursuing a person, and the byproduct of that person is power. Does that make sense? Because I think sometimes we get religious, and we have this idea that to pursue the gifts, you can't have the character. No, it's both. You pursue both character and gifts. In fact, he said to pursue the gifts. And so it's not either or. So uh, with that being said, let's look at a couple things that I felt Holy Spirit wanted you guys to hear this morning. And the first part I want to get to <clears throat> is Genesis 1, uh, verses 1 and 2. I always like to go back to the beginning. And the Holy Spirit's right there. This is amazing. So it says... In the beginning, or the Genesis, the foundation, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Okay, so I'm going to break down a little bit of what's going on here. Uh, the word created, bara, it means to form or fashion. What's interesting about this verb is God is always the subject. I didn't know that. So wherever there's creation, creativity, He's always the subject. So for you that are creative, artistic, musical, you're displaying the person of God in your art. Isn't that amazing? You're displaying Jesus. There's my last, there's my last week. Yeah. <laughs> I was just to read it. Year after year. Uh, you got me all distracted now. Okay. So God is always the subject of this verb to create, to form, to fashion. Uh, it's a, in its standard form. And it reveals that creating is a divine capacity. It was originally used for the idea of carving or cutting out, implying that creating is similar to sculpting. It applies both to bringing something into existence or fashioning existing matter into something new. Now, we know the earth was without form. The earth was already here. So he refashioned it. 
okay? And, and over the earth was deep, and that's like a primeval uh, um, uh, body of water. So there was no land, right? And so uh, the earth was without form. And what's funny is the next Hebrew words are tohu and bohu. And so uh, without form is tohu. Um, what's that weird food people eat? Tofu. 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 So it ain't tofu. <laughs> it's tohu. <laughs> uh, so in the Hebrew it means it had no form but also confusion. Now, it's a hard word to interpret into English, uh, but the idea is chaos, confusion, and disorder. And, I, and I, I'm going to go somewhere with this. It's all things that are opposed to the or, uh, organization, direction, and order that God has demonstrated. So it's very chaotic. There was no form. The earth was also void or empty, which is bohu. And so tohu and bohu are always together. <coughs> Whenever you see those words, they're always together. Now here's my favorite part. The Holy Spirit was hovering over the face of the waters. The word hovering means to move hover or tremble it's a picture of holy spirit vibrating over the waters just waiting for the first decree of god okay now the holy spirit executes the decrees of god you guys have learned in past teachings that the promise is in the decree if you want the promise and this is in uh, first or second peter where it says he's given us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these we begin to share in the nature of Jesus Christ having the promises of God manifest in your life requires a decree you got to give the Holy Ghost something to work with he needs something to execute he needs some a tangible substance and that's the Word of God and so if you're not seeing the promises you need to look right here first because your mouth within it the Word of God is in right it's not far away it's not something you have to go after the word is in your mouth and in your heart so when you confess the word in faith from a heart place not a mental ascent you confess it from a heart belief then the the Holy Spirit's able to get to work in uh, literally bringing organization bringing form bringing order where there was a chaos and darkness in your life and so if you want to see the promises you got to take action it begins with your mouth and then also your behavior okay so the first lesson uh, is Holy Spirit is just waiting to execute the decrees of God that we release into the earth Okay? And I'm going to get more into that, but this is the foundation of the next part. So how many of you guys are artistic? You love creating, building, painting, music? Oh, yeah. Okay. Me? Yeah. You yeah. know. Websites. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that's about where I'm at. Uh, when I build <coughs> furniture in the past, I don't build it anymore. It's never square. My <laughs> things are usually like this. And Mike's like, don't you measure? Yeah, but then when I put it together, it just like, that's how it ends up, you know? And so that's what it looks like. I probably came from the descendants that built the Leaning Tower of Pisa. <laughs> okay, let's um, go over to Exodus 31. Oh, was it? <clears throat> okay, so now Pisa and pizza aren't related are they no. <laughs> all right so this is one of my most favorite passages in the Old Testament and we're going to read verses 1 through or 11 through wait no 1 through 11 and uh, wait a minute yeah okay so verse uh, 1 <coughs> Exodus 31 then the Lord spoke to Moses saying see I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, in all <coughs> workmanship, to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting jewels for setting, in carving wood, 
and to work in all workmanship. And I, indeed, I have appointed him a Aholiab, the son of whoever, of the tribe of Dan. And I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans, that they may make all I have commanded you. The tabernacle of meeting, the ark of the testimony, and the mercy seat that is on it, and all the furniture of the tabernacle, the table, its utensils, the pure lampstand with all its utensils, the altar of incense, burnt offering with all its utensils, the labor in its base, the garments of ministry, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his son, sons to minister as priests, and the anointing oil and sweet incense for the holy place, according to all that I have commanded you, uh, they shall do. So basically, we see the very first baptism or feeling of the Holy Spirit, I, I probably phrase it that way, uh, is with the building of the house of God. Now, back then, you know, obviously the tabernacle and all its utensils were used where today we're the house of God, individually as well as corporately and then universally. That same wisdom is to be in the church as well. We may not be fashioning actual objects, but true uh, fivefold ministers, apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers are fashioning and forming people with wisdom and skill, not to fulfill the pastor's dream only, but to be equipped and trained for the work of ministry. Every true apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher is all about giving you the tools you need in order to minister to people in whatever function and wherever he has you do that. That is a wisdom that is needed for those that have that office. You guys as workers of ministry in the marketplace, in Bible studies, when people come to your home, uh, at the store, wherever it is, you also have that same wisdom to call out the destiny that you see in people, to lay hands on the sick, to cast out devils when needed, to resurrect the dead. There's no dividing line. There is no dividing line between sacred and secular, and there is no dividing line where you've got these lording over you. It is always the leaders upholding and lifting you into that position of ministry. It should be an upside down triangle. That's what it should be, where the leaders are on the bottom. What did Jesus say? If you want to be greatest, you've got to become least. If you want to be a, a, a leader, you've got to become a servant. That's how it's supposed to work. And so we're seeing a shaking, and we're going to see where God is going to start turning things upside down because for too long, people have taken the call on their lives and used it as a superiority. And they've taken the gifts and the, the things Holy Spirit uses them to do and put it upon themselves that they're special. And that's why they get to do those things. And it should never, ever be the case. And so here we have this amazing anointing and wisdom and feeling of the Holy Spirit that came upon them. Now, remember, Holy Spirit vibrated, hovered, okay? So this is for you musicians. Well, Basilel literally means in the shadow of God or in the protection of God. But what's interesting is in his name and the word hovering referring to the Holy Spirit is a musical connotation or a musical idea. So his name is, uh, in his name is a word that means a ringing of the bell, a whirring, and a buzzing. Basically like the vibration caused or created from sound like a musical instrument or a voice. Like when you talk, when you sing, it's breath going over your chords right. and vibrating them, right? right? When the Lord said, let there be light, light is sound on a different frequency. So the first thing God released was sound, music, vibration, light. He's very musical. In fact, in our DNA, we all have a song. You can send off your DNA and they will send you back your song. We are literally created to worship Him. And it shouldn't be any surprise to me, Lucifer was created with musical instruments, timbrels and, and things like that. And so his job is when it was time to worship, uh, he was a covering cherub. You know, He covered the throne of God. He was to protect it. And so whenever worship would start, I could just picture him releasing his wings 
uh, and, and to cover the glory and then the sounds and the light and all that just hitting and, and vibrating off of him because he was even made out of jewels and all these colors would come off. Well, according to, it might be Isaiah 43, when we sing in the original language, we're releasing a sound that has color. Is that interesting? Mm -hmm. And so they're very closely uh, tied together. You know, on YouTube, they, they have a, a video where somebody has taken a, oh, I don't know what it was. It looked like a big pan, uh -huh. but they it vibrate. It would yeah. hooked right into the uh, sound. And then they would, they showed the, I think it was the Change. Hebrew sound. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. And then they made us, a, 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 it makes us several, a pattern. Yeah. So yeah. it was very interesting. Is and how I think that, the Hebrew language is the only one that does so. that, I heard. Mm -hmm. I think so. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. So I thought that was language. very interesting. Is It's not just a sound. It was also a pattern. Yes. To, that related to that. Yeah. Uh, now, Bezalel, um, I like this because he was literally in the sound of God. And he was from the tribe of Judah that means praise. And so prophetically speaking... Bezalel is the idea of living in the sound or praise of God, which releases a creative wisdom and or the light, the revelation. So obviously I'm speaking prophetically, reading a lot into his name. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm <coughs> speaking prophetically, of course. So the Bible says that Bezalel was filled with the Spirit of God in wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and all manner of workmanship to design artistic works. Now, you'll also see in verse 6 that God put wisdom in the hearts of all gifted artisans. Now, the word fill means to fill, to be full, to be complete, to furnish, to satisfy. It can express the state of being in which a certain container is holding to capacity a particular object. Now, here's what's important. The tea right there, it's not full, right? The water, it's not full. The only time something is full is when it's overflowing. Okay? That's why the Bible says be ever filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's over in Ephesians. Let's look at that real quick. And then let me show you how he does this. Because we're going to worship, you know, and I just wanted to set this foundation. I wanted to get us focused and our affection, our attention focused on Holy Spirit. Uh, in uh, Ephesians 5... Let's start with verse uh, 17. He says, Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And then he tells us what his will is. Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissip dissipation, but be filled or ever filled. It's a continuous presence, intense, with the Spirit. How? Now, the original language was speaking to yourself and to one another in Psalms, and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord giving thanks to him for all things etc etc and submitting to one another in the fear of God that means leaders submitting to their congregations and congregations submitting to their leaders no warding over one another but here's what's interesting speaking to yourself and to one another making melody in your heart do you know God put what's called <clears throat> heart strings in our hearts they're little literal strings. And mm -hmm. if you have a broken heart, they can be torn. So if you've ever gone through something hard and your heart literally hurt, that's what was happening. The heart strings were being torn. He made our hearts a musical instrument. This is amazing to me. Mm -hmm. But the way you're ever filled is that melody, that worship, that singing, that praise when you're living in the praise of God, right? And so... Uh, to me, melody is the quickest way to get Holy Spirit someplace. Remember when we had live worship and Kent would start that melody? Right. It's like, you know, it took it to a whole new level. So anyway, Holy Spirit is just so much fun. Like he could be boring and stodgy and sitting there, you know, all perfect and in order. Instead, he loves music. He loves color. He loves creation and design. I, yeah, well, I was laughing because... Um, it was Friday morning, and I was getting things ready to cook and la la, and I'm just singing away, you know, whatever. I go to the store and I come back and I just started to sing in 
in tongues. It's like, well, where'd that come from? I had not planned on, oh, you know, and it was just, and it was no tune, no, I mean, the, nothing familiar, but it was, yeah. I thought, yeah, well, yeah, Holy Spirit. singing in uh, English and singing very, in tongues. And it was a very joyful song. And I think song. Colossians speaks about that, where it brings in the tongues factor uh, in Colossians of singing uh, in the Spirit and in English, or maybe Corinthians, I'm not sure. Okay, so here's what's crazy. Bez, uh, Bezalel was the container holding to capacity Holy Spirit during the act of creating the objects for the tabernacle. So he was filled with him. And along with that came several things that we get to walk in every day. It's not temporary for us like it was for Bezalel. So wisdom. Uh, I'm going to go through these pretty <coughs> quick. It's skill, experience, and shrewdness. We'll get into that in a second. It's expressed as technical capability, and it's inherent in the created order. God alone knows where wisdom dwells and where it originates, according to Job, but with Jesus Christ, we see the origin of wisdom. It's Him. For He is the wisdom of God. Uh, shrewd means astute and sharp in practical matters. God is always practical. He adds the super to natural. You see what I mean? Well, and I think it, it tells us that that ought to be practical. Yeah. That that ought to be an everyday thing. Yeah. And see where, like, you guys raised your hands. Some of us didn't. My husband is very creative with his hands and the way he processes and thinks. I'm a computer nerd. So when I saw uh, technical capability, I was like, praise God. Mm -hmm. At least I am in the, you know, <laughs> creative function uh -huh. here. Uh, so it's uh, astute and sharp and practical matters. How you handle your money, how you take care of your home, how you take care of your family, how you build your business, how you work at, in the location where you work. There should be some type of overwhelmingly supernatural practicality that you bring to the table where you can solve problems that no one else can solve. I literally get paid lots of money to solve problems that literally when a client says what should we do like one i had a client show up uh where i work part-time and he sets down and he's like i'm about to you know just basically strangle all of my employees <laughs> and so i'm like okay so then he starts talking like how are we going to fix this this is what i do if you want to know i'm immediately like okay holy ghost how are we going to fix this because i have no idea you know so i just start listening He's talking, I start listening, and then all of a sudden I'm like, well, how about we do this, this, and this? Sounds like a plan. Let's get together, discuss it, get it organized, and we'll execute it. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> See, that is creativity. That is wisdom. All of us possess it, even if we're not write, you know, artists and writers and things like that. The word understanding is insight. And it's always associated with both wisdom and knowledge, and it's co contrasted with foolishness. Now, if you've never heard Bill Johnson's teaching on wisdom, you got to hear it. One thing he brought out is wisdom builds a city or takes a city over. Here's what's interesting. When it says that salt loses its taste, that word taste is foolish. So we are like salt sprinkled in society. And we're to bring flavor. We're to bring that pizzazz, so to speak, that just that presence of Holy Spirit and that wisdom that He encompasses. And whenever we stop doing that, we have lost the taste of God or we are now foolish. And so uh, understanding is the opposite of foolish. And you get all of this by being in His presence. The word knowledge is learning knowing, discernment, insight, again, and notion. It's technical or specific knowledge along with wisdom and understanding. Knowledge also affects behavior. So if you're walking in knowledge, your behavior changes. Again, if I was to look back at my early years parenting Kent, or my early years being a wife, or whatever it is, I was an idiot. And you don't need to agree, Mike. <laughs> But as I was in the presence, like I was looking back at my initial Instagram photos, my initial graphics I designed, my initial website, and I'm like, wow, 
I'm surprised I have any clients. And so, you know, it's the favor of God that comes upon you, but you get it in your knowledge, your insight, and your skill, but your behavior begins to be affected. And the workmanship, this takes it again to the marketplace. God is always after the marketplace. If you want to know where He's working, go to the marketplace. It's work, occupation, business, something made, property, how you take care of your property, uh, workmanship. It's used for God's creative work, for human labor, labor, skilled craftsmanship, and agriculture. Agriculture. Isn't that cool? See, that's why I like cows. Well, I, I knew a lady, and I always said she could <laughs> stick a dead, a dead branch in the in the ground, and it would grow. She just she had that gift. Yeah. Not to be TMI, but I am so glad I put deodorant on this morning because I'm like burning up here. Okay. Yeah, are you hot now? No, I'm glad to. Oh, yes. Yes, I'm sure you are. Thank you for doing So the word gift, uh, it means wise, one who is skilled or experienced, like in the area of building. Craftsmen, metal workers, fabrics, etc. Now, I like this word, and let me tell you why. I find too many people feel like they're average, mm -hmm. feel like they're normal, insignificant. And every one of us is gifted because Holy Spirit lives in us. You know what I mean? I've heard of people that were born again that had a, a very low IQ, say 70 or 80. And through the Holy Spirit's dwelling, there's a, a black gentleman that comes on Sid Roth, and he tells <coughs> this story where I think his IQ was like 78 or something. And he got born again and spirit-filled and began to get in the Word, and now his IQ is like 120 or something like that. God takes clay vessels and makes them spectacular. So, lesson number two. Because you are filled with Holy Spirit, you're filled with wisdom and creativity to solve problems, create beauty, learn new things, and build community. You know, I, Holy Spirit tricked me. I was going to brag on Him. Have you noticed that He's encouraging you guys? I did not recognize that until just now. That stinker. Okay. <laughs> but I, want, you know, I just want you all to know you all are special. You know, you're special. There's nothing average about you guys. So, just real quick, uh, we're going to get into holiness next week. I'm gonna start, oh, I'm so excited. Beauty is a byproduct of wisdom and holiness. Okay? A byproduct of wisdom and holiness. It's not how your face is formed. It's not where you live. It's not what car you drive. It's none of that. It's seen in your surroundings, however. Practical matters and things. How you conduct yourself. How you bring form to where there is chaos. Where uh, you interact with others. It's like wherever me and Mike lived before we bought our house, we took care of that home. Uh, I tried to make it pretty. Again, <laughs> low wisdom in those days. Um, but, you know, I, I tried to bring beauty. Uh, what amazed the Queen of Sheba wasn't just talking to Solomon. What amazed him or her was the plates, his servants.